Welcome to service, everyone. Uh, Pastor Steve, we're grateful to have you with us today, and I just want to say shalom to everybody who is celebrating a Day of Atonement at sundown here locally, but I'm sure in Israel it's been going for since the sun set. So uh, we talked quite at length quite a bit on Sunday about the Day of Atonement, and uh, it's uh, something that is fascinating to me, and I won't talk about it tonight, but um, I encourage anyone to, uh, you know, reach out and to find out as much as you can about it because it's a wonderful subject that uh, is absolutely, it's Old Testament, of course, but Jesus fulfilled it when he went into, hi, hello, hi, Ruff, come on, all right, we got, we got Holy Spirit-filled dogs in the house tonight, amen, all right, praise God, all right, so tonight, um, just finishing that thought about um, Jesus Christ went into the heavenly holy of holies with his own blood once for all time. And so every single time that we miss it, whenever we sin, whenever we need that, that, that cleansing, that, that peaceful feeling of, of the presence of God and his forgiveness and love, and we just remember what Jesus Christ did when he went into the heavenly uh, uh, holy of holies and placed his own blood on that mercy seat once for all time. Hebrews is so clear about what Jesus Christ did for us. Amen. All right, so shalom to all of you, and welcome again to Wayne and to Dolores. And our subject tonight is a very, very uh, interesting subject for many of us. And then for others of it, it's somewhat of an intimidating subject. The subject tonight is spiritual warfare. And I guess if I were to ask a question, I got a lot of questions I'd like to ask everyone, but why were, would we be involved in spiritual warfare? Because we are spirits. God made us, we are spirit, soul, and body, and because of that, we live in a natural world, but we also live in a spiritual world. Just as much as the natural, the spiritual realm is real. And so we want to talk about some of the things that are on our sheet tonight that are uh, conducive to development spiritually in your life. And, and I believe that uh, as you learn these things, if you will step out and not be afraid of the, 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 the term spiritual warfare, and you'll listen and you'll receive it. I mean, obviously most of you are familiar with it, but there are many of you that are not familiar with it or you've re rejected this idea from Scripture. And so we're going to talk about it as, as plainly as possible tonight. And uh, my two friends, my, my sister and my brother, they have uh, opinions and they have perspectives that we want to hear. So, uh, Father, we thank you for the subject of spiritual warfare. Uh, Father, I'm grateful that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through you for the pulling down of strongholds. So we thank you tonight for this subject in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, uh, for the pulling down of strongholds, uh, why would, in the world would anybody as a Christian want to ever talk about spiritual warfare? Because uh, every one of us at some point in our life has dealt with a stronghold of some sort that needed to be broken. Maybe you've been a, a saint all your life and you've never uh, crossed into the world and you've never uh, gone wrong in any way. Uh, praise God for you. But for the most part, most of us have uh, crossed into areas where we got into or dabbled with or fell into some sort of sin or behavior or conduct that caused us to have an, a door open to a stronghold. And so the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. God wants all of us to be free. If you don't listen to me at all anymore tonight, remember, God wants us free. Uh, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. He paid that price for us to be free. And so our first scripture tonight is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4 from the New Living Translation. Uh, it starts out with, we are human. Amen. Amen. But we don't wage war as humans do. We're not picking up the uh, weapons of, of natural warfare. Uh, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. So right there uh, in the New Living Translation, many of you know it from King James, New King James Amplified or whatever version you prefer, but the New Living puts it down in some real simple terms that we are human and we don't wage war as humans do. We fight with God's mighty weapons 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just ask Dolores to uh, just uh, opine on her opinion of the term spiritual warfare and what it means to her, and then I'll pass it over to my brother Wayne and ask him uh, in, in, for his perspective on the subject of spiritual warfare. And un, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you're going to hear my perspective too. So God bless you for listening tonight, for joining us, and for participating in our topic of spiritual warfare. Dolores, please. Okay, when I think about uh, spiritual warfare... I, I never thought about it in terms of my opinion, just the awareness that we're in warfare constantly. Not sometimes, not a day here or a day there or this week or maybe next month, but it's constantly, all day, every day. <laughs> and it's in, it behooves us to know how to fight. And I've heard multiple um, preachers say, or particularly, can't, his name escapes me right now, that if you, if the devil can get you fighting in the flesh, he will whip you every time. But if you keep him in the spirit, you will win every time. So we need to understand that we're constantly fighting, and it's our flesh fighting our spirit. Amen. Very good. Thank you very much. Wayne? Um, the verse that comes to mind, and not the oh, oh, all right. There's a lot of, the, the verse that comes to mind is uh, the one that says, um, your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom to devour. And so they say one of the biggest tricks of the enemy is to get people to believe that he don't exist. And if they don't think that he exists, they won't understand that they have an enemy of their spirit and he's seeking to devour us. And so once you know that you have an enemy, then you can uh, stand strong. You can act appropriately. And so I guess that's the biggest thing is spiritual uh, warfare is just knowing that there is a war going on. Amen. And uh, that key word, uh, resist, that would probably be the most common usage of spiritual warfare in, you know, down-to-earth terms is that my walk with Christ is not only uh, a walk of daily fellowship, but on the opposite side, it is a continual uh, recognition and awareness of my, my need to resist the devil, and he will flee. If you're a Christian that's new, or you just have never wanted to accept the fact that we do have an opponent, we do have a, uh, an adversary, and uh, the, the history and the study of our adversary is fascinating, and I, and I pray that we don't focus ever on that, but we should know a little bit about our enemy, and uh, he is the devil, as a roaring lion, he walks about seeking whom he may devour, but Apostle Peter said, resist him steadfast in faith. So God has given us many weapons to use to walk in complete victory on a consistent basis, but resisting is one of the keys. As Dolores said, there's many aspects of how we walk this life and how we choose to live, but God has equipped us with an array of gifts, talents, weapons, and most importantly, my brothers and sisters, if you shut me down, don't shut me down until I tell you that the greatest weapon that God ever gave us is the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and the word of God. Those three are the top three weapons that we use, but we're going to talk about a few other things that we do. But the objective here is to be free. Whom, again, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I want to live a life of freedom. I know what it's like to be in bondage. I know what it's like to be in fear. Fear is probably the number one bondage on earth. To live a life of fear, I, 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 how do I want to say this? I pity the people that don't understand that Christ has set us free from fear. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Christ took that fear. It says all over the Bible we don't have to live in fear. So that's one of the first things. Would you like to uh, share anything or should we continue here between either of you? No, I think about um, when I first started coming to Three Degrees and before I had such a stronghold of fear, it was just like ridiculous. Not like afraid to go out of my house or anything like that, but just 
fear, especially concerning my finances. It was just crazy. And I was determined that I have to break that thing. <laughs> I have to break it. So through prayer here at church, uh, the ladies prayed for me at the women's meeting. And then I've just had to walk it out. But, yeah, it's pretty intense. Ladies and gentlemen, if you heard her say she had to walk it out, mm -hmm. there is no hop, skip, and a jump over real issues. And the fastest way to defeat fear is to face fear. Mm -hmm. And all of us had to, you know, I just want to put it in a perspective that someone might be able to relate to. I remember that when Jesus took me by the hand, and this is in my in my, my, my spiritual uh, uh, vision of Jesus, took me by the hand, and he walked me to the mountain of fear. And he pointed to the mountain, and he said, speak to the mountain, and command it to be removed, and move out of your way. And it was fear. And when I began to speak to that mountain of fear, according to what I believe the Lord said to do, that mountain began to break, that mountain began to move, and pretty soon fear was no long, longer dominating my life. And, and the greatest part about it was that the Lord was there. He took me by the hand and led me to defeat the fear in my life. And so I encourage anyone, you're not on your own. This is not a weapon that you have to take on by yourself. Of course, you're not going to share the depths of your fear with too many people if you're, if you're, if you're really deeply in fear, maybe as Dolores had said. But uh, God is the one that will bring you, the Holy Spirit will bring you to that place when you're ready to face your fear and to say, be removed in my life in Jesus' name. I just like the fact uh, with your, your testimony that, you know, you, tr you have trusted people that you can tell. And, and, I, and one another reason why, you know, we advocate for attending church, because um, fear or things like that can grip you to the point that you just stay at home and you keep it to, the, to yourself. And a lot of times that's where the devil has that win or continue to torture you. But if you come to another believer who, who may not necessarily, this, this is one of their strong areas, right? We all got areas that we strong a weekend maybe um, that we're struggling with. But if you can come to another believer and they stand with me and they can pray for you in faith, that can be the thing that help breaks the, uh, the, the attack of the enemy on our life. And so understanding the necessity for having brothers and sisters of the Lord that we can bring our things to. Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So let's go down this list. Um, it says prideful arrogance, human reason, and lying spirits are all from the same source. And they are the ones that lie to you and make you afraid. Uh, Jesus said that the devil is a liar. Christians, you need to say that. When he comes to you with those tormenting thoughts, maybe as he uh, tormented Dolores uh, with thoughts of insufficiency or lack or whatever it is, the lying spirit, and, and the Lord said, remind him that the devil is a liar uh, as Brother uh, one, of the, one of the radio ministers used to say, uh, the devil is defeated, God is exalted, and Jesus is Lord. Well, if you just remember those three things and say that the devil is defeated, uh, God is exalted, and Jesus is Lord, that will propel you to step higher in your faith. Christians, none of these things can happen without faith. You're going to have to believe something. And right now, if you're in fear, you're believing lies from the enemy. So now you're going to have to turn your attention from believing fear to putting your faith with all your heart into the word of God that promises you deliverance from fear. Amen. And so we're looking at that. That, that would be the basic level of spiritual warfare. As we talk about spiritual warfare here, uh, we go on to the next line where it says uh, uh, we need to learn how to resist the enemy. Christians, when we talk about spiritual warfare, it isn't some uh, way out... Uh, 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 get up on a mountain and uh, beat a drum and do some uh, really crazy stuff. No, spiritual warfare is every day resisting the enemy in your life. If you just left tonight with only the idea that resisting the enemy is spiritual warfare, you'd be on the right track. But there's so much depth to this. And why, was, why is there so much depth, depth to this subject? Because there are so many people in so many different kinds of bondages and fears that need to know how to break free. And again, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. It's the most, possibly the most important thing in your Christian life. Because you can't enjoy your Christianity if you're afraid, if you're nervous, if you're upset, if you're in bondage to anything in life. Amen. All right, so we need to learn how to resist the enemy. 
not fall prey to his lies by using the mighty weapons God has given us to enforce the victory we have in Jesus. There are many different avenues of spiritual warfare, but and then I added on my own sheet, fighting, resisting, winning, enforcing the enemy's defeat. Enforcing the enemy's defeat, which is not for you to fight, but for you to enforce the victory through your faith. And the way you enforce the victory is you simply agree with what Jesus did. Jesus, you fought, you won the battle, you gave it all to me. I, the, uh, I will not be defeated and I will not fret. Redeemed by the blood of Jesus, I've been loosed from Satan's grip. Okay, I could go on and sing for you, but I won't. It's a great song about being free. Hallelujah. And that's what it's all about. So that is the objective of this whole message about spiritual warfare is to be free in your life from anything that you're in bondage to or you're tempted in or whatever areas afraid or whatever areas it is. So anything from you guys before we proceed? All right, so going forward, uh, spiritual warfare and our weapons include but are not limited to praise. That's one of the simplest things we can do to fight. Anytime that fear comes on me, I just turn my attention to the Lord and say, praise you, Lord, praise you, Jesus. Now, you know what? God, girls are, are easy to say, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. But, but, you know, sometimes guys need a kick in the pants uh, to, to spur them on to just step past that line. And, you know, I pick on guys all the time. And I don't continue to pick on guys all the time because I know that when the men that came into my life, that God brought into my life, they didn't cut me slack. They were tough. And you know what, really, they, they reminded me of military men, and they were in the military. And in the military, they don't cut any slack. So if this is spiritual warfare, and the same uh, uh, things apply to uh, as natural warfare, is there must be an aspect of discipline. There must be an aspect of diligence. There must be an aspect of doing and following orders. And sometimes you just need to simply go, Lord, these are orders from headquarters, and I'm going to do it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to obey your direction and your command. And praise God, it works. It works. It works. It works. God is good all the time. And so some of these weapons that we have but are not limited to praise, to praise the Lord. And if you, and I'd rather have Wayne or Dolores for you to listen to them because you think that my job as the pastor is to be full of praise. So what I'd rather have you do is to be around other spirit-filled Christians. Now, spirit-filled Christians are freer than general Christians to just blow out a praise the Lord, blow out a thank you, Jesus, blow out a glory to God, glory to God, blow out a hallelujah. It's just you get freer when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so I highly recommend every person is baptized in the Holy Spirit because you get free. I want to be free. Whom the Son is set free is free indeed. And that is another weapon and tool to help you to cross over that line of stepping out in faith. And, and, and here's, the, here's the question about uh, being ashamed of saying hallelujah or praise the Lord or thank you, Jesus, in front of somebody else. So what? So what? It's your faith. Amen. It's your Lord. It's your Savior. It's your Christianity. And if I want to blow out a thank you, Lord, if I want to blow out a hallelujah, if I want to blow out a glory to God, I'm going to do it. And I'm not going to care what people think because you know what? They might be full of fear and the things you say might help them to step out of that fear. I see Dolores is ready to share. Go ahead, my friend. No, I was just thinking about a, a song that I learned some years ago about praise. There's only two times to praise the Lord, when you feel like it and when you don't. <laughs> Absolutely. Praise his, what, did, what did the psalmist say? His praise shall continually be coming out of my mouth. Why? Who is David? Who is the psalmist? What is it with him? He's special, dude. He's special. Sorry for calling y'all dudes. There's some girls in here, but girls in the audience too. Welcome everybody. But David is special. He was unashamed to worship, to praise, and to lift up the hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Wayne, do you have anything? Yeah, I guess two things. Yeah, definitely it's great to have David um, an example of, of a man. Because um, especially the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. And so when you look at him and look at his attitudes and the way how he was free and he was praising to the point that it was ridiculous 
even to his wife, like, you a king. Kings don't act that way, right? And even the world tells us about men, we don't act that way out there singing and acting a fool. You, you don't do that. There's a certain type of dignity that you have to have about you. But when you see men of the kingdom acting differently, then we can mimic that. So, so understanding that we have to overcome that roadblock. But, but also going, probably going along with that is just that when you think about warfare, singing doesn't seem like it goes along with that. Right. So God ways are different than our ways. And so when we talk about warfare, I'm like, let me go get a gun or a sword or a knife, something, you know, throw some blows. But God's ways are not our ways. And so I think about um, what's that, the walls of Jericho with the when they sent the, the praises around and, and they worshiped like that. And so and that's when the walls came down. Or you think about Paul and Silas in jail and they're in chains and they began to praise in there and the chains came off and the, and the jail opened up. And then their praise, not only did it set them free, but those that was locked up with them set them free too. And so even more reason and where we have to be um, willing to praise in these situations because there's other people that's around us that need to be free. That's why I love what you do, Andrew, when you go out to some of these, um, these uh, world squares and begin to worship the Lord because there's other people around that are being set free. We may not know it on this side of the kingdom um, or on, on this side of heaven, but it's, it's happening. And so, yes, as believers, those are one of the tactics for sure in my life, one of the biggest ones that I use to try to keep myself free when the enemy tried to press me is to throw my headphones on and get to worship in the Lord. So even then, I can't even hear my own voice. And so um, worship, yes, definitely. You, you want to worship your way out. I'm grateful tonight to have Dolores and, and Wayne telling it like it is, because if I tell you, sometimes you go, well, you know, you're the pastor. You're supposed to do it that way. But these two are telling you like it is. And praise God. You know what? Scripture says, Jesus said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained praise to still the enemy. So we've got praise, we've got worship, we've got singing, we've got these weapons to still the enemy. What does stilling the enemy mean? Shut him up. When he's harassing you with, with temptations to fear, to temptations to cower and to want to throw in the towel or quit or just succumb to temptation or whatever it is. The Bible says out, out of the mouth, Jesus said out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, even the, time, the smallest, the, the least in the kingdom can offer praise and it stills the enemy and the avenger. It quiets him down. He won't stick around if you praise the Lord because he doesn't like it. You may be the best singer. You, must have, you might have the best voice or you might have the worst voice. But either way, if you out of your mouth come praises and singing, you will still the enemy and the avenger. It's awesome. Praise God. It works. Amen. All right, so we're talking about spiritual warfare. The weapons included are not limited to praise, worship, singing, quoting scripture. Why in the world would we quote scripture? Because it's the weapon of our warfare. The Bible is the sword of the spirit. The apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and then praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we've got praise and worship and singing and quoting scripture and praying in the spirit. Boy, there it is right there. I didn't even look ahead one moment. We'll talk about praying. Well, well, let's tackle this. Let's just touch this right now. Let me, let me ask you something. We're a charismatic church. Charismatic, we're a uh, uh, word, of, uh, word of faith or a uh, whatever you want to call us. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in, in speaking in other tongues. And so the question would arise... Do I have to pray in other tongues to engage in spiritual warfare? No, of course not. But why wouldn't you? If, if Paul said in 14.2 of Corinthians, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to God, and in the spirit he's speaking mysteries, why would, not, why would I not want to participate in that? Where basically he's given me a free pass to just present the whole thing right up there where the enemy can't understand it. It's a weapon of our warfare, and it's not carnal, and it's mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And so we use all of our weapons, and so being able to pray in the Spirit, to pray in other tongues, is in a powerful, powerful way to get yourself free, to, to get out of fear, and to get out of bondage. We believe it, we do it, and we're grateful for the gift in Jesus' name. Do you pray in the Spirit? Do you pray in the Spirit? Well, we got a consensus here. And if we're right, then guess who's wrong? No, just kidding. No, no, no. We're not putting that out there. Come on. All right. Can, can I add to that? Because when I first came to church, speaking in tongues was a weird thing to me. Um, it's weird to all of us. Right? <laughs> and so 
so what they say, don't throw away the baby with the bathwater, right? The, 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 the idea of speaking in tongues can be uh, so much that one just go totally away from it. But reading the word, and it says that this is available to us. And so as we seek to apply it, you know, we want to do that in our lives. And, but also one of the things that was helpful for me is going to a prayer group where they did it. So then I would just sit around and I would just listen to them and I would take it in and it would make me more comfortable with it. So then when I got home by myself to be able to practice it, um, it came a little bit more easier for me. And so that may be one of the things as a jumping point for some of you, if that's not something that you do um, on a regular basis is coming to prayer on Tuesday nights or even come before prayer um, or before Wednesday service. Wednesday night, Sunday night, so, or Wednesday night, Sunday morning. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, and it can be like a, a, a jumping point for you to get you to start doing it a little bit more regular. If it's something that's so valuable to us, this is definitely something we want to take advantage of. Praise God. The value is incredible. and We could talk about that, but we'll continue to talk about our spiritual worship. All right, so let's worship. Why does worship work for spiritual warfare? Because Satan is jealous of worship to God. That's what caused him to fall. He hates it when you do it, so do it as much as you can. So worship God verbally. How do you worship God? Father, I worship you. Lord Jesus, I worship you. Holy Spirit, I worship you. Just saying those things and repeating yourself. Someone says, well, that's just repetition. Hey, if it makes the enemy flee, I'm going to repeat, repeat, repeat. Amen. So that worship is a bunch of things, but this is the simplicity of worship, just some of the things that we've suggested. But come and listen to, to your brothers and sisters. Come and listen to them in prayer group. Come and listen to them during that when they stand up here and they sing and they worship and they talk and they tell you things. Those are uh, the, uh, aspects of worship that everybody's invited to participate in. All right, singing songs with God's word in it. Here's an example in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter 15. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. Now, I could sing it for you, but I'm not going to do it because we're going to move forward here. Lord. But it's just songs that are filled with God's word is spiritual worship. So let yourself express yourself in song, singing unto the Lord, making melodies in your heart to the Lord. These are all different aspects of, of spiritual worship or pounding the devil's head. So if you could sing a song you like and pound the devil's head, why don't you do it? Just jump in and do it wherever you are. Obviously, it may not be conducive when you're sitting next to your coworkers at work to start singing these songs to fight the enemy, but do what you need to do to win and not suffer at his, at his hands. Amen. All right, Corey, go ahead. One. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, when I thought about this topic, and, and my, you know, I didn't even look at these notes, but a lot of the stuff that I have is about worship. And so I'm going to uh, ask Sam to put two scriptures up there. The first one is uh, Psalm 1611. Uh, and I think... Uh, you have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. All right. So, so the significant part in this, you will fill me with joy in your presence. So, so hold on to that. And then uh, Nehemiah 8.10. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. All right. So the joy of the Lord is our strength. And our joy is found in his presence. And so as we worship and we are in his presence, we are filled with joy. And as we are filled with joy, that's our strength for the battle. I guess that's I guess the, what I wrote down was strength for the struggle. So we speaking about spiritual warfare. As we're in spiritual warfare, we want to be strong in the Lord. And in order to be strong in the Lord, you need to be in his presence. And in his presence is a fullness of joy. And so that's why one of the reasons why we got to contend to be in that place, that safe space. And you brought up something on Sunday that um, was concerning for me, for believers, which I think is a real deal, is having a clear conscience in worship. And so, so let's speak a little bit. Maybe you can. Why? Because sometimes the praying in tongues is not just because it's weird. Sometimes not worshiping is not just because it's uncomfortable. It's because our conscience. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can throw that your way. And that what, I'm, what I'm thinking about is the need for us to have a clear conscience with the Lord. 
Right. So we don't want to go in his presence at all if we're, 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 we're out of his will. We're doing things that's wrong. So we need to be able to go before the Lord um, uh, where he gives us his grace and mercy. So he can, um, as, as we repent, I can't think of the, the first John, is it 1 9? Help me out, Pastor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. First John 1 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. To cleanse our mind. Spiritually speaking, we good, but our conscience is corrupt in that place of sin, and so we draw back like Adam instead of drawing near. And so in order to do these things that we're going to talk about the whole list, sometimes our conscience and our uh, unrighteous conduct keep us away from pursuing these things that allows us to overcome what the enemy is doing in our life. I would just add to that, too, that if, when you're in that place and you realize, okay, I'm being convicted, not condemned, there is a difference, convicted that what I've said, what I've done, what, whatever it is, that this is grieving God, thank him for showing you instead of running away. I know as, as a young Christian, somehow in my mind I thought, oh, since I'm saved, I should be perfect. And so when God would convict me of things, I would want to run. I was like, forget it. I'm not ever going to get this right. <laughs> so you run. And no, I have learned. Thank him when he shows you. He's fathering you. Mm. When you're a baby, you have to learn how to walk. You learn how to talk. You learn how to eat. You learn how to dress yourself. When you mess up, which one of you kicks his kid? You messed up. You didn't do it. Not one of you would do that. And God doesn't do it to us. Amen. He doesn't do it to us. So we need to thank you for showing me. Thank you for I didn't know. And it shows that you're growing, the fact that you even are sensitive to it. So don't run from him, run to him. To confirm that with the scripture, then we could say uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse uh, 16, come boldly. I don't, know, I don't know if that's the correct reference, but come boldly to the throne to obtain mercy. Some will go, well, I'm not going to go to God because he's the one that convicted me or he's mad and he's going to bop me on the head or, or take something away from me. No, he's not. It says, come boldly to the throne to obtain mercy, to find grace, to help in that specific time of need. And so I go there, guys, I'm probably there more than any of you because of, he prompts me with these, these uh, convicts, you know, I'm convicted. And so where do you go when you're convicted? Do you run and hide and go back to the world and say, oh, chunk this, I can't take this anymore, I'm running away and going back? No, you run boldly, you run to, run to God, as you said, and you come boldly to the throne to obtain mercy, to find grace to help in time of need. And you get it every time, every single time. And so we encourage you not to run from God. Did you say it or did you say it? Run from God, run from God to run to God, amen. All right, so, all right, cool. Let's, uh, let's pick up the pace here as we... Um, all right, quoting scripture is obvious. It's the sword of the spirit. You got to put some faith in it tonight. Say, tonight I'm putting faith in quoting scripture as the sword of the spirit because I've got to start somewhere. And so I'm going to take some of these verses that, that are so obvious to me and I'm going to use them and I'm going to swing that sword in the spirit and I'm going to trust God that it is what he says it is and that it is the sword of the spirit. All right, declarations or faith-filled confessions formed from God's word are powerful weapons. We talk about confession all the time. Declaring, uh, when you got saved, the Bible says that you believed in your heart and, uh, and confession was made with your mouth. Well, that's the same th thing, the way you do everything. Victory comes through believing in your heart that you're victorious and confessing with your mouth that you have the victory. They go hand in hand. You're going to have to speak. You're going to have to talk. You're going to have to say it because that is spiritual warfare, opening your mouth and declaring it. All right, so fighting fire with fire. We could get into this subject of fighting fire, but use the spiritual weapons that God has provided you for this purpose. All right, so going on in the King James Version of our opening scripture, for we walk, 
though, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war af- after the flesh. So we're not wrestling with people. We're not wrestling with natural things. We're in a spiritual world. You're an eternal spirit right now. The moment you got saved, you became eternal spirit. Before you were saved, you were eternally damned. But then you accepted Christ as your Savior. You crossed into the kingdom of God, and now you're eternally saved. And therefore, the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And I wish we had two more hours because a stronghold is anything that holds you back, anything that makes you afraid, anything that you're in bondage to, anything that makes you sin, anything from your past, anything that you dig up, anything that's in your closet, all those things are strongholds. You know, if you get it, you know, some people say, well, strongholds are these really, really deep, deep ingrained sins in your life. Yeah, they can be. But anything can be a stronghold if you let it be. So you need to resist. You need to fight. You need to stand. You need to use the weapons of your warfare, which are not carnal, but mighty through God. All right, we're, we're, still, we're still moving here on the front page. Uh, Ephesians says, pray, 618, praying always with all prayer. We could get into that because there's all types of prayer and supplication for the saints and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. So that's, an, uh, that's a continuation from Ephesians talking about the weapons that God has given us and they're on the back page. So I want to just quickly briefly tell you about different types of prayer. You need to gauge your prayer life. Where am I on this scale? I'm responsible for the scale. I didn't get out of a book. The reason I'm saying that is you get mad about it, get mad at me, all right? So it says basic prayer. Basic prayer is all about me, myself, and I, focused on me and my needs only. If you only know the Lord's Prayer, then you are a candidate for a prayer upgrade. So there are Christians that are in that level of only me, 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 and they, the only prayer they know is the Lord's Prayer, and they've never really ventured out. All right, secondly, general prayer is the next level up. Simple prayers for things in this life that matter to you, for your future, and then for a few needs of other people. Once in a while, you throw in a smattering of prayer for other people. All right, that's, a, that's a, another level. But advanced prayer now, as you get higher in your Christianity, it includes your needs, of course, but there is prayers for others, prayers for the church, prayers for the body of Christ, and prayers for the word world as God in the Bible sees it. So now you're stepping out and it's not all focused on you. You're beginning to pray for other people. You're beginning to pray for the brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. You're praying for the entire body of Christ throughout the earth. And then you're also beginning to pray for things that you see in the Bible that God wants for the kingdom of God. So that's advanced prayer. But each of us is called to step higher in our prayer walk. All right, then spiritual warfare. Now we get to this highest, basically, maybe the highest level of prayer, which is spiritual warfare. And that is using the weapons provided in the New Testament for the greatest effectiveness in any Christian's prayer life for the church, for the saints, for the world, and for the lost. So all the time, in your whatever level you're at, you can always pray for the lost. If mom and dad aren't saved, if sister or brother, son or daughter, whoever it is, somebody you care about, if they're not saved, whatever level you're at, you can pray the prayer of intercession for them. Intercession just simply means you're going to God to ask God to save their soul. And then you just, how do you say that? You just say, God, save them. God, help them. God, deliver them. God, help them to accept Christ as their Savior. You can say it any way you want. There are no rules to these different levels of prayer. But this gives you an idea where you identify yourself in your prayer life. Now, we've got people around here that advance prayers. They've been praying consistently from the time they got saved, and they've been growing higher and higher levels of prayer. And now they're, they're, they're in intercessory prayer for high-level things. Well, maybe that's just not on your agenda right now. Maybe you're going, how do I get past this, this boss that I work for or, or this girlfriend that I got that isn't saved and I know I shouldn't be uh, messing around with her or vice versa with a, a guy that the girls are hanging out with. Hey, you need to get free. You need to pray for God's help. You need to seek first the kingdom of God. Put God first and all these things will fall into place. All right, so we're wrapping up this time here. Uh, We've got these five points here. We're going to continue for a few minutes after. Just stay with us for a moment. This is so important. And number one on the back page is Jesus' name spoken in faith out loud to any problem, difficulty, or challenge brought to you is the most effective thing you can do. His name. Faith in his name. 
Number two, the blood of Christ. I'm going to let you guys chime in in a, in a second here. The blood of Christ saying, I pray the blood. Uh, some people go, that's weird. No, it's, it's Im- critically important that you have the courage to say, I pray the blood over this situation because the blood of Jesus, Satan hates it. He's terrified of it. He has no weapons against it. And when you pray the blood, you are praying the power of God in that situation. So the blood of Christ, speaking it, praying it, applying it against your spiritual foes or in natural circumstances. Number three, quoting God's word in prayer. Absolutely. Learn the scripture. Let it come out of your mouth. Uh, let it be a part of your, or your life. The sword of the Spirit, using it as a weapon of choice in your prayer. Now, f- item four, intercession, praying in the Spirit for your family, for troubled saints. Hey, if you know a Christian that's struggling, you don't know what's going on in their brain. They might try and explain it to you, but you really don't know how the different connecting points in the neurons of the brain and all that stuff are going on. God knows every speck of what's going on. So when you pray in the Spirit for somebody, you may not understand what you're praying, but trust God that He knows how to fix what's going on in their brain, in their body, in their life, in their family, whatever it is. That's called intercession or praying in the Spirit for troubled saints, for the lost of this world, for things that you have no knowledge or details about. You can still pray in the Spirit for it and pray effectively and praying for God's kingdom and his saints. So this is uh, another, uh, uh, another weapon here. And lastly, five is spirit-led prayer. Using, pray, or, uh, using praying in the spirit as the main tool for speaking out mysteries and secrets. Uh, 14 of Corinthians says that when anyone prays in an unknown tongue, they don't pray unto, uh, to men. They don't talk to men. They talk to God in the spirit they speak mysteries. And I want us to end tonight on that idea of speaking mysteries in prayer because mysteries are secrets, secrets that no one knows. If the devil knew, he'd use it against people, but he doesn't know. God has solutions to issues, problems, people's miseries, people's dependencies. Uh, I know someone that had come to us recently and talked about the addiction that their daughter has to meth. I don't know how to solve a meth addiction. But boy, could I tell them what to pray. And I could pray with them. And I could point them. And I could help them to see that God knows how to fix meth addictions. God knows how to deliver people. He needs, knows how to bring them out of the deepest bondage. Whatever bondage there is in your life, whatever bondage you've been brought up, whatever family bondage you have been had attached to you and someone said you'll never get free of, God has a way to get you free. But other people need to pray. We need to pray. We need to do spiritual warfare. We need to go to bat. We need to intercede for people. And so God knows what they need. So item five here is spirit-led prayer using praying in the Spirit as the main tool for speaking out mysteries and secrets, things that you have no knowledge or detail about in God's kingdom for the saints or in any situation. God wants to use somebody. Why not you? Anybody before we close want to comment or add to what we've just talked about? Yeah, what I... Sam, to pull up the last scripture, Exodus 14, 13, um, I just want to speak to the fact that sometimes when we learn... Um, tactics or principles of the Word of God, we try to use them like recipes. And we try to cook stuff. And so you, you know, you'll apply all of these methods and you'll come back and say, Pastor, I tried these things last week and I haven't got my breakthrough. What, what am I doing wrong? And so one of the things the Lord has placed upon my heart is, um, one is to, is to worship while you wait. But the, the, um, the scripture, uh, those who wait on the Lord, he'll renew their strength. But this one right here, Moses is speaking to the Lord in, in Exodus 13, and uh, him and God is having a conversation. You mind? Sure. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance of the Lord. He will bring you this day. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. We say, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. The Lord shall fight for you. You should hold your peace and praise God for the victory. Amen. Amen. So standing still, if you go back to that one one more time, I'm sorry. Do not stand stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm. Whatever the spiritual battle is, you applying these principles, you applying these methods, you're talking about finances and probably tithing is one of those things, right? So you tithe one week and then you're looking for the breakthrough by the end of the week. 
it doesn't, it doesn't always work. So you stand firm on those things that the Lord has placed upon you to do. And then if you, if you continue to do so, that next verse 14, Sam, I'm sorry, I keep you arguing. The, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. You need to continue to do what you've been told to do. Do what you know to do, and you will have the salvation that you're looking for. This is not a microwave thing that you can put together and cook up some stuff, and then you make God. You said, no, there's some time elements to this, and allow God to do it. But if you stand firm, you will win. Excellent. I would say the other thing to remember, I think about David facing Goliath, and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would dare defy the armies of the Lord? You have a covenant. Learn what's in your covenant. The simplicity of the covenant is God has everything. You don't, but you get his. And so therefore, use the covenant to win the battles that God will fight your battles for you. Put your faith in the Lord. So let's summarize uh, tonight as, uh, as we've discussed it in a minor way. I mean, this is a subject that we could continue on for weeks and weeks, but the topic is spiritual warfare. Christians, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For they that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. Faith in these things we're talking about, faith in what your brothers and sisters are doing. Hey, this isn't just a bless me club where we gather uh, two, three times a week because we just like to hang out together. No, this is, we believe in what we're doing. We come to prayer. It takes some people half an hour, 45 minutes to get here, then stay for an hour or an hour plus for prayer, and then take another half an hour, 45 minutes to get home. But they do it not because it's a bless me club, but because they believe in prayer, they believe in intercession, and they believe when they get to a place in these levels of prayer that now I've turned my attention from just me, myself, and I, but I want to be used by God to be effective for other people, to be effective for the church, to be effective for the kingdom so I'm going to come give my time and these saints do they come early they stay late they give their time in prayer there are other avenues of people serving in the church but the prayer ministry is because they believe it but the aspect of belief is faith we must believe what we're doing and the only way you can really believe what you're doing is to find it in the word and stand on those verses in the bible and hold fast to your profession of faith without wavering because he's faithful that promise. And I want to encourage somebody tonight. Again, without faith, it's impossible to please him. We're going to have to believe this. This isn't made up. This is straight from the word. He could talk to you for another hour. She could talk to you for an hour. I could talk to you for another hour. We could go on and on about this subject. But somewhere along the line, you're going to have to dip your toe in and say, I believe what they're telling me and I believe I need to participate. How do I start? And then you just turn it over to the Lord and you look for him to show you, lead you, and guide you into an opening into a life of prayer involving spiritual warfare. Can someone say amen tonight? Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, we'll take, we, we're going to close in a minute or two, but can we take one question tonight about intercessory prayer, spiritual warfare, any of these things. Uh, my brother back there, you seem to have, be participating very much. In, do you have a question tonight? Maybe you're a guest tonight, so we'll go to you. Any, any question about what we're saying? You don't have to. I don't want to put you on the spot. It looks like you do. Or comment? I don't know. Tell us your name. Uh, my name is Michael. Michael, th great name. Um, yeah, I, uh, I guess I found it was very uh, much led by the Holy Spirit for y'all and me as well because it's been hard to find any congregation that will even talk about spiritual warfare and there's a lot of stigma about it even though it's so real, so real. It's more real than most people make it out to be. Uh, so it's, it's really actually comforting to just be in a group of people, people talking about it openly, trying to help people wake up to the reality of it because um, sometimes it can be pretty lonely to be aware of it when 
not everyone else wants to look at the reality of it. So I don't know. I guess if that's okay for me to that's say. That's cool. Thank you. That's so, excellent. And thank you. So, Welcome to service tonight, Michael. Yeah. I had if one Dolores thing. Dolores has one. Um, perspective is everything. It is everything. And I would encourage you to read the parable of the sower and the seed. Matthew 13, Mark 4. Satan, uh, sometimes we wonder, why is this happening to me? Some stuff we bring on ourselves and we know when we do it. But other things, why is this happening to me? Because Satan comes immediately to steal the word. The battle is not personal. It's not personal. Stop making it about you. And understand that you're in, you've got an enemy who's trying to steal the word from you. You have to resist him. You've got to resist him. I Read those parables in both <laughs> Matthew and Mark because it, it just lays it out. And then when you talk about resisting God, it says first, humble yourself. <laughs> that means you've got to do the word. Then resist him. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, praise God. Well, let's finish up tonight. We always do it the same way. Uh, it's not just vain repetition, but we want anyone who is wherever you are that you can say the salvation prayer and believe it together. Let's say, Dear God in heaven. Dear God, God in heaven. heaven. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe, I believe that, that Jesus Christ, Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for me. I believe, I believe that, that he died on the cross, cross for me. And was raised again from the dead. And was raised again from the dead. So that I can have eternal life. So that I can have eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. And be my Lord. And be my Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask that you forgive me of my sin. I receive forgiveness now. And I receive your forgiveness now. I thank and praise you for it. And I thank and praise you for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to say a prayer over the offering tonight. And we just want to say thank you to anybody watching or anybody here tonight. There are people that are faithfully diligent to, to support the ministry. And we're just grateful for uh, We pray that you prosper and are in health even as your souls prosper. Father, we pray over the offering tonight. We thank you for the generosity of the people that bring their tithes, their gifts, their offerings into the storehouse, that there might be meat in their house. But Lord, we pray back on them that they would prosper and be in health even as their souls prosper as they grow in the Lord, that things would break through, that things would get better, that things would change, that life would be a blessing that they could walk in. Thank you for the saints of God that are participating in the support of this ministry. Father, we promise to use all the money, all the things that come into this ministry for your work and your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless Amen. you. Thank you for staying a little bit late tonight. And thank you to Dolores and Wayne and Michael. Amen.